Good morning to you all, and thank you for the opportunity to join you to converse about Al-Ghazali and about my current thinking on Al-Ghazali's philosophy. A special thanks is due to Richard for issuing the kind invitation, and to Sarah and Richard jointly for putting together this online conference. The Marquette Denver Medieval Online Conference series is shaping up to be a tremendous resource not only for those of us working in the field of medieval philosophy, but for any and all interested parties. In light of this, and in light of the fact that I certainly intend to avail myself of the many marvellous lectures now going up online, it's only fair, I suppose, that I also lend my own face and name to the enterprise. This notwithstanding the rather tre terrible trepidation I feel about releasing this video, which is effectively the first one I have ever shot. I can only hope that the technical glitches are minimal, and that any other inelegance and clumsiness is one that a. you can tolerate, and b. I can live down. My talk for this conference has had two alternate titles, between which I have found myself unable to decide. One is simply Al-Ghazali's project, and the other Al-Ghazali's authorship. Either title will tell you immediately that what I want to talk about this morning is quite insanely ambitious in scope. In brief, I want us to reconsider what Al-Ghazali was doing in his life, or with his life, from 1095 onwards, and how that should influence our reading of his works. To take this from the other direction, my proposal is that we consider afresh what Al-Ghazali's authorship can tell us about his life's course, concentrating for a change on those materials that are less obviously autobiographical than the famous deliverer from error, or the man's Persian language correspondence. Now, before I begin a few technical details, as you can see from the backdrop, I'm recording this in beautiful British Columbia, South Pender Island. I really couldn't ask for a lovelier setting, but it must be said that this environment is vulnerable to some disturbance. You may hear the odd overflying aircraft, for instance, and for that I apologise. I may also get suddenly rained upon, in which case it's anybody's guess what happens next. Um, the sun will probably start glaring somewhere behind me in a little while, um, and again, I may need to adjust the settings at that point. Finally, there's a non-negligible chance that one or two of my two brilliant boys will jump at me at any given moment and demand either to be fed or to be given a push on the rope swing. I won't do so, of course, but it'll probably be enough for me to lose my train of thought. Um, there are also other pot potential visitors. Yesterday, when I made a pass at recording to this talk, Recording this talk, I was one stopped by an eagle and another time by a hummingbird. And I did have to stop on both occasions. Two more things very quickly. One, I will pause this recording every 12 to 14 minutes in order to have the segments come out at a reasonable length. As I discovered yesterday, it's a fool's errand to try to pass a several gigabyte file through the bottleneck that is presumably the only broadband cable connecting Pender Island to the mainland. If you are viewing this recording as a continuous broadcast, then that is all thanks to Richard. Two, I will not be reading out a pre-prepared text. As those of you know who have met me before, I seem constitutionally unable to follow a script. It just doesn't work. My brain freezes up and very soon my eyes will follow. All that remains for me then is to go where my thoughts lead me and hope that what comes out of my mouth as a consequence isn't too incomprehensible or incoherent. There is, I'll readily admit, a half-baked ma article manuscript in front of me on this laptop that contains the meat of my presentation. I'll be scrolling through it on occasion so as not to lose entirely my train of thought. But if you have to suffer through an inordinate amount of umming and aahing, or the odd stammer, or double, or even triple take, all I can offer is my sincere apology along with the assurance that the alternative would be much worse. Now then, the topic at hand. Let me begin from some personal remarks that hopefully will help to frame the enterprise. I've been working on Al-Ghazali for about 20 years now, off and on, the entire length of my academic career stretching back to my master's thesis. During this time, I have consistently and unapologetically approached Al-Ghazali from a philosophical standpoint. That is, I have treated Al-Ghazali as a philosopher who deserves to be accorded both the respect and the critical scrutiny that the best philosophers invite. I have adopted this course of action primarily because of how I have been trained, and, if I am being honest, because it is philosophers I have mostly been trying to impress. But my scholarly trajectory has also been partly determined by who and what I am not 
I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a theologian. And so questions about Al-Ghazali's ultimate conception of the transcendent, or about salvation, etc., have not much moved me, except inasmuch as these have given rise to questions of a more philosophical nature. And, because I have not moved in Orientalist cycle, circles either, questions about Al-Ghazali's influences on the one hand, or the influence he had on the other, have likewise been of incidental interest. I have seen no need to pass judgment on where Al-Ghazali stands in the broader current of nativizing Hellenism, for example, um, to use a very useful phrase I adopted from Abdul Hamid Sabra. Nor have I thought anything much of what seemed to me obvious from the start, that Al-Ghazali's primary intellectual engagement was always with the peripatetic philosophical tradition widely conceived, and with Avicenna in particular, and that this engagement had a positive rather than a negative character. I did not think, moreover, that any grand statement to such an effect would ever be necessary. It would be enough, I thought, if I joined others in advancing incrementally our understanding of where Al-Ghazali stood on a range of philosophical problems, and saw how he measured up in offering solutions to them. Such an effort would suffice in moving the scholarly needle closer to where it should be. Or so I thought. And so, by and large, it has proved to be. With all due and modesty, I have generally been satisfied with what I have accomplished, and I feel that my many piecemeal studies on Al-Ghazali add up to a mosaic of sorts through which some significant light, at least, refracts from Al-Ghazali's thought world to ours. Yet two developments together have conspired to shake me out of my own dogmatic slumbers, strictly bush league though those may be. One is the simple fact that a book contract has been hanging over my head now for a very long time, the book bears the simple title Al-Ghazali. It's for Oxford's Great Medieval Thinkers series. And faced with the task of providing a newcomer-friendly scholarly overview, well, relatively newcomer-friendly anyway, I cannot any longer dodge the question of how I would characterize Al-Ghazali's work as a whole. And if I am being truthful to that mission, then that assessment will have to grow to encompass the wide vistas of the revival of the religious sciences at a minimum. Al-Ghazali's own professed masterwork, which has reams of citations from scripture and from various Islamic religious figures, and also it also grows to encompass liberal borrowings from previous authors of the likes of Abu Talib al-Makki and Arahib al-Isfahani. That's to say that I need to provide some kind of an engagement myself um, with Al-Ghazali's relation to the previous Islamic spiritual tradition widely conceived. So, with this book assignment coming to term, I can, for example, no longer put off deciding whether to call Al-Ghazali a philosophical theologian or a religious philosopher. For the record, I incline toward the latter, but we can talk about this during the discussion. I think that um, characterizing Al-Ghazali as a religious philosopher in Roughly, Harry Austrian's, uh, Austrian Wolfson's understanding of the term is more accurate than calling him a philosophical theologian um, in the understanding of that term given in, say, late 20th century Anglophone philosophy of religion. Um, Sacha Traeger prefers the latter term, philosophical theologian, for reasons that I don't quite understand. Um, to continue, I cannot either avoid the prickly task of giving some characterization however hedging and hesitant, of Al-Ghazali's relationship to the Arabic philosophical tradition as a whole, as opposed to simply describing what Al-Ghazali does with parts of it. It's been the latter that's been of primary interest to me as a working philosopher, of course. I've simply wanted to figure out the mechanics of how exactly Al-Ghazali engages with one philosophical idea or another, um, some kind of, of philosophical mode of analysis or another, and so on, to see what, what, he, what exactly he does with it. Um, that's standard operating procedure for a, for a philosophical historian of philosophy, to use some, um, again, current parlance. But if I'm um, going to provide some kind of a, a synoptic overview of, of Al-Ghazali, then surely I have to give some kind of an account of why Al-Ghazali despite his philosophical leanings and philosophical workings, the way I see them, um, did not deign to call himself a philosopher, and indeed why he chose to, to paint philosophy and philosophers in the light that he did. All right, 
The second development that I wanted to mention came about largely by chance, but is no less personal for it. I found myself in the south of New Zealand for a few years, and teaching in a religious studies program, and therefore in need of immersing myself in the ways and mores of the present-day academic study of religion. It was a fascinating, if also intense, exercise in mid-career further education, and throughout all of it, one lesson was hammered home again and again and again that seemed directly re relevant to my study of Al-Ghazali. Modern religious studies as an academic discipline pays incessant attention to what I would call strategies of legitimation. Um, what I mean by this is the following. The way present-day scholars of religion see it, in religious contexts, no less than in scholarly circles, authors become authorities, in large part due to how successfully they can frame their intellectual efforts as an extension of some legitimate line of in previous investigation, one that has roots stretching deep into the past, preferably. The precise ways in which this happens may vary widely. A given scholar may follow a previously established and tightly circumscribed path very closely, or, alternatively, she or he may push for an image as a self-fessed reformer or maverick. Both subservience to tradition and deviation from it, then, can be part of the mix. The delegitimation of opponents and rivals may or may not feed into the enterprise. What's crucial and what is constant is that in such an exercise, one should always demonstrate that well-grounded procedures are being followed for getting at the truth and for presenting it. The applicability of this kind of lens on Al-Ghazali's activities should be readily obvious. Indeed, I was more than a little embarrassed to realize how comprehensively I had failed to take it account of any such matters previously when presenting Al-Ghazali. While it is all well and good to celebrate what is philosophical in Al-Ghazali, there can be no mistaking the way he appeals to several different orders of legitimation when presenting the results of his deliberations. Just to take the example of the revival, um, the layers of the Quran, prophetic traditions, companions, then independent reasoning are readily apparent whenever Al-Ghazali wishes to establish the importance of a given theme. And in a much subtler, but at the same time more intriguing manner, Al-Ghazali's way of, of tackling the philosopher's claims to demonstration, of course, form a, a, a kind of a, um, a, almost a, a textbook case of how a thinker may adopt and appropriate um, another um, stream of thoughts, traditions on legitimation, and twist them to her or his own purposes. It therefore came as something of surprise to me to realize upon reading Ken Garden's book, The First Islamic Reviver, that that was in fact the first full monograph-length examination of Al-Ghazali that I had encountered, whose execution relied so fully on following the strictures and protocols of modern-day religious studies. Um, by this, I, I would mean that, that um, as near as I can tell, um, Ken seeks and, and expects legitimacy for his own findings due to the fact that, that he expects the, his readership to be employing and applying the criteria of present-day academic study of religion. Um, when when assessing his reading or, and his interpretation of Al Ghazali, both Al Ghazali's um, systematic systematic um, so, sort of um, life world and and his um, and the way we read his the actual course of his life, um, and I say that principally because religious studies scholars take no small amount of amusement in applying the same kind of critical scrutiny to one another's work as they. Um, do in applying these criteria to historical texts. I think that at this point it is um, a, an appropriate place to pause. I will see you very soon. Hello again. I feel as though Richard should probably run some advertisements from this event sponsors in these pauses. Ken Garden's The First Islamic Reviver a book that was published altogether fortuitously in 2014, almost, I would say, providentially from my personal standpoint, gave me serious pause and provided me with much food for thought when trying to frame Al-Ghazali not only as a philosopher, but also as a religious authority of his own making. <laughs> 
Um, Ken's reading of Al-Ghazali is both perceptive and nuanced, and there's much in it to recommend it to um, any any student of Al-Ghazali. Most importantly, Ken is surely correct to emphasize how Al-Ghazali's literary production both was shaped by the real-life concerns Al-Ghazali had, and how it in turn helped and was, was geared to shape certain social realities that Al-Ghazali wanted to reform and that he wanted to see put in place. Al-Ghazali's revival of the religious sciences, far from being an expression of some interiorized, interiorized spirituality, um, shows itself to be a, a, a monument um, with a very clear social and, and um, religious, academic and political agenda. What's more, I think that Ken, more forcefully than anybody else, puts forward the point, which has been raised by others, mind you, that um, Al-Ghazali's Deliverer from Error, which has often been treated as a an intellectual autobiography, pure and simple, more clearly illuminates and more clearly attaches to the events surrounding Al-Ghazali's return to the public spotlight in 1106 and his resumption of public teaching than it does any other period in Al-Ghazali's life, including pointedly his departure from Baghdad in 1095. Um, Ken and others, I'm thinking here about people such as Jonathan A.C. Brown, have shown that that um, the contours of the Deliverer refer very clearly to specific events around the time of Al-Ghazali's return to the spotlight, the controversy that surrounded the revival of the religious sciences during that time in Transoxania, and how in the Deliverer, Al-Ghazali is subtly fending off charges of him being too philosophical for some tastes, at least. Um, that said, it's quite possible that the way that um, Ken Garden's book follows, again, the protocols and strictures of religious studies contributes at least to the un unease that I felt when assessing the results of his book as a whole. Um, that is to say that um, Ken, in his desire to view Al-Ghazali and his life's works much as a religious studies scholar would, seemed to me to be giving short shrift for, to Al-Ghazali, the philosopher. And this is, of course, an entirely parochial worry to have, and um, one might might ask, um, and so from me at this point, at which point I should um, probably need to shrug and say, well, um, we simply have, have different audiences. But let me try nonetheless to pinpoint at least some of the reasons why I feel um, Ken and I, despite our views aligning in many ways, as you will see, um, finally parting ways um, when it comes to certain other important points. Ken's take, very briefly, is that, that the scale of action in particular, Mizan al-Amal, a, a treatise that al-Ghazali released in 1095, although we do not know when, when exactly he may have prepared it, um, shows that, that by that time, that is to say, before al-Ghazali's own departure from Baghdad, his public departure from Baghdad and, and relinquishing of his position, had not only absorbed but also adopted and accepted the crucial lessons of the philosophers when it came to matters of philosophical psychology, moral psychology, and this, I think, is most pregnant from, from Ken's point of view, soteriology, theory of salvation, and, and conception of ultimate happiness, or sa'ada. Um, consistent with other present-day scholars such as Sasha Traeger, um, uh, Ken underlines how Al-Ghazali makes a distinction between mere salvation, najat, and and, salvation, um, and, and and actual felicity or salvation, sa'ada. And Al-Ghazali, already by, judging by the evidence of the scale of action, posits that whereas salvation is something that is available to all, that is to say, um, a, a security and, and a sort, sort of a, a, a fairly advantageous outcome to one's immortal soul. That's something that's available to, to every believer. Felicity, which is to say, say a kind of a cont contemplative bliss, is something that, that is only available to a certain elite within 
Islam. Now, consistent with the, the development of the Sufi tradition up until that point, um, Al-Ghazali holds in the scale of action and consistently throughout the rest of his authorship that this is something that is available to those who contemplate God, who attempt to draw near to God by contemplating God and his attributes and his creation. Or perhaps I should put that in, uh, in, in the exactly opposite order, who first aspire to understand God's creation and thereby to, to ascend to an understanding of his attributes and from, from there then um, to draw near to the Godhead itself, which, however, in a fundamental sense remains um, uh, uh, um, inaccessible. What's distinctive about Ghazali's take in his own age and time, at the very least, according to Ken and according to many others, is that Al-Ghazali, in the scale of action, seems to conflate what the Sufis are doing with what the philosophical tradition posits as, as the, the sort of the ultimate aim of humankind. Al-Ghazali, judging again by the evidence of the, um, of the scale of action, is willing to hold that the contemplation of, of, of God that um, the blessed engage in is a kind of an intellectual bliss, and his fundamental analysis of what happens in this kind of contemplation um, follows roughly Avicenna's model of intellection. So, um, with um, armed with this evidence, Al um, Ken Garden's take is that Al Ghazali, by the time that we come to 1095, had essentially adopted the philosophical path, taking that to be a true representation of the aims of Islam, and was now wondering how to parlay these findings into a, a sort of a, a new model of presenting what um, Islam is about and what Islamic spirituality is about. And the whole agenda of the revival then issues as a kind of an outcome of these deliberations. And two things here merit, um, mer merit here um, increased um, extra scrutiny. One is that um, Ken's take is that um, all ev all the events that surrounded Al Ghazali's departure from from da Baghdad, his supposed spiritual crisis, um, his relinquishing of his position, his his, um, his sort of um, somewhat derogatory take on the kinds of activities in which he had engaged before um, theology legal studies, and so on, um, were carefully orchestrated in order to provide him with a platform, suitable platform for instituting, now launching this project of the revival of the religious sciences. Although Ken does not come quite out and say it, what, what he seems to be implying is that there was no such deep-set spiritual crisis as is described by the Deliverer from Error. He's willing to um, acknowledge that that probably when Al Ghazali speaks of his troubles in in leaving behind his worldly attachments and the the pangs of guilt that he felt in leaving behind his students or his family, then he's describing some real events. But but Ken never seems to take very seriously the possibility that Al Ghazali would have been hit by an existential crisis of any great magnitude, or that um, we should in any way take seriously, for instance, Al Ghazali's sort of a quasi-medical description of what ailed him in the, the final months of 1095. A second related point is 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 the following: um, Ken, in a number of of passages, not only in the monograph but in a couple of related. Um, articles stresses that when he reads the scale of action, he does not see a man beset by any any kind of, of doubt, whether intellectual or spiritual. Instead, um, Ken's take is that 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 what he sees is a man clearly at the height of his powers, supremely confident in his abilities and his, his uh, um, and his his so, so, sort of um, understanding of the, the intellectual landscape of the time. 
Um, Kin draws attention specifically to three chapters of the Mizan al-Amal. The first one, which sets the scene in which um, which lays out Al-Ghazali's understanding of of, of um, felicity, ultimate um, otherworldly felicity, Sa'ada, and chapters seven and eight, which compare the path taken by the theoreticians or, or the, those the, those who engage in speculation, Anadar, Nadar, um, with the those who follow the Sufi path. And and um, as Ken has it, um, the, the the following distinction is is made. The intellectual path is the more secure one and the likelier to um, to, to yield lasting results. However, it is um, a path open only to the to a very chosen few, those with a superior intellectual ability and curiosity, um, those whose Whose um, whose reasoning has not been clouded by the the sort of the negative character traits, those who have received um, a, a positive kind of instruction, etc., etc. And this means that that um, th- this kind of intellectual path is resolutely not meant for all. Al Ghazali warns that that um, for most to be engaging in such an exercise is only to invite um, heresy and error. And this seems to be not such a subtle dig at the the kind of the way, various ways in which um, kalam and kalam and fiqh had gone wrong. A theme that Al Ghazali picks up in in um, more detail in revival in the revival of the religious sciences and in adjacent works. Um, I've tried to, uh, to to trace some of this in a recent article of mine called Al Ghazali on on error, um, which came out in the collected volume edited by Frank Griffel last year. Um, The Sufi path carries its own kinds of risks. Al-Ghazali says that that without the proper kind of of not only um, ethical training but also intellectual training, it's likely to lead to vain imaginings and and sort of um, false misconceptions about what the Sufi experiences as a result of their their self-denouncing exercises and their their, their sort of um, self-examination. Um, Al Ghazali nonetheless says that that the, the the sort of the Sufi path, when pursued in in moderation and when with with suitable kind of strictures in place, is the more suitable for 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 the majority of people, um, and and that then um, the Sufi path is the likeliest to yield the greatest results if it is pursued by somebody who has first taken up the intellectual path who has who has um taken the path of reasoning as far as it will go um also recognizing the places where where it 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 cannot lead that is to say um the intellectual path is most fruitfully pursued by somebody who also recognizes the limits of either demonstrative or dialectical reasoning which is something that connects up neatly with what Al Ghazali has has previously said in his polemical works that it, against the infamies of the Bathanites and the incoherence of the philosophers. So, when as 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 Ken reads it, um, Al Ghazali, in the scale of action, puts himself forward as somebody who um, has now done the appropriate groundwork in the theoretical sciences and is therefore able to interpret the results that come from pursuing a Sufi path in the correct manner. Um, he at least, that is to say, Al-Ghazali at least, says that there is no harm in pursuing such a thing and that the uh, and, and that one of the expected results is a, a greater kind of clarity and insight into the secrets of religion than otherwise would be possible. Um, and now with that, um, can... Um, thinks that he's in it within his rights to say that the whole project of the revival of the religious sciences um, comes into being as a kind of an explication of this. The, um, the revival gives materials for the commoners to be pursuing um, the kind of Sufism that is is truly suitable to the majority, that is to say, something that's not too radical, not too self-denouncing. Al-Ghazali is, of course, mindful of the fact that if everybody were to um, pursue 
a, a kind of a condemnation of the world in, in the fullest sense, then the present world order would cease to exist, which he sees as an undesirable outcome. Um, he also thinks that this would result in, in precisely the kinds of, 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 of sort, sort of um, unruly and, and um, unmanageable results that he's warned about. So, um, with that, let me take my leave of, of Ken's interpretation and, and voice some of my misgivings about it. Hello. As you can see, there's been a glitch in the matrix. Alternatively, I had to shift this table in order to avoid the worst of the sun's glare, and while I was doing so, I decided to make a cup of coffee. Let me take your pick. So, what are some of the specific quarrels that I have with Ken's chosen take on Al-Ghazali's intellectual development? Well, for one thing, if Al-Ghazali's sole aim was to introduce more Avicenna into the Kalam mainstream, then one might ask why he didn't simply go the way of al juwaini before him, and scholars such as most spectacularly Fahraddin al-Razi after him. Um, we see from Ghazali's own moderation in belief, for instance, that, that he was, in fact, engaged around 1095 in an effort um, to, to further the approach taken by al juwaini prior um, and introduce further Avicenna categories and modes of analysis into what is essentially a, a um, Kalam mo mode of analyzing reality and of establishing a metaphysics for proving the existence of God and um, his attributes, etc., etc. More to the point, though, um, the kind of thinker that one finds in, um, in the pages of the first Islamic reviver is not the thinker that I've found in my own investigations into the revival of the religious sciences. Far from being a subservient um, follower and student of Avicenna, the Al-Ghazali that I find in the revival, as well as, say, in um, Al-Ghazali's treatise on the beautiful names of God, and for that matter in, in the scale of action itself, is um, a, a, a thinker altogether unafraid to issue quite severe and serious modifications to the to Avicenna, at least as we find in, in Avicenna's major treatises. The philosopher, and I don't do not hesitate to call him that, the philosopher Al-Ghazali that we find in, Al, uh, in, in, in his mature authorship in 1095 onwards is an eclectic thinker, but not for, for, for certain. Um, one who mixes elements found in Avicenna with those found in, in Miskawaih by way of Rahib al-Isfahani, um, and quite possibly other, other thinkers more explicitly in, in the Kindi tradition, possibly um, elements found in the Arabic Plotinus um, directly, etc., etc. Um, but this eclecticism is not without purpose, nor is it without a unifying vision of, of al-Ghazali's very own. So my feeling is that that um, in order to do justice to the, the um, Al-Ghazali's evolving thought, we have to take seriously the notion that, that he was engaged in an effort to reform not only the religious sciences of the day, that is to say, Kalam, Fiqh, as well as, as the, the preaching done in, in, in the Islamic heartlands, but also an attempt to... Um, give, give um, serious thought to how the philosophical tradition would have to be reconceived and reconstituted in order better to reflect um, the Islamic um, religious tradition and the, the path to salvation and happiness exactly as Al-Ghazali himself saw it. Now, with that in mind, what I would propose is that, that I do, in the following, um, a, a very brief overview of Al-Ghazali's authorship in the lead-up to his departure from Baghdad in 1095. And I do this partly as a corrective to what I see as a, a more general problem in, in, in um, Ghazali studies at the pre present moment. Um, many people have expressed an interest, and this is altogether salutary, in Al-Ghazali's um, thought during his residency, initial residency in, in Baghdad. <clears throat> 
Um, but it's been the habit of most people to be looking at one or the other out of Al-Ghazali's treatises from that period to the exclusion, more or less, of the rest. Thus, um, this, um, Ken Gardner's focus is almost explicitly on the scale of action, and um, this is also a, a treatise that, that's mined for materials by, say, uh, Muhammad Sharif before him and, and, and certain others. Um, whereas, for instance, Michael Marmura or Ayman Shihade or um, Richard Frank in uh, Al-Ghazali and the Asherite school um, to find, take their focus almost exclusively on the Iqtisad fil Iltikad, moderation in belief, or as Frank Griffel would put it, the balanced book on what to believe. Frank Griffel, for that matter, um, has his sights on the incoherence of the philosophers above everything else, and so on and so forth. I should probably mention Farouk Mehta's uh, monograph on, on um, the Fadai, um, uh, which is to say his, um, his, his study of Al-Ghazali's polemic against the Batanites, which is, to my knowledge, the only, only um, lengthy study of that topic, in the English language again, at the very, um, at the very least. So, to survey these works, I think, will, will help us to, to figure out what exactly Al-Ghazali had, um, at that point, gained from the philosophical tradition and what he thought he was doing um, with it up, into, up to and including that time. So, to begin with, um, one must, first of all, um, take notice of just how thin the literary evidence is um, when it comes to Al-Ghazali's activities prior to his departure from Baghdad. We have a range of legal treatises, treatises in fiqh proper, the extended, the middling, possibly the, the um, concise exposition, the wajiz as well. Um, and of course we have the sifted annotations from the time that he was a pupil of Jawainis in, in Nishapur. Um, these do not, um, to my knowledge, yield much that would aid us in understanding the revival project or anything that came subsequent. Then from 1094, we have the infamies of the Bathanites, which is interesting on a number of levels. First of all, um, Al-Ghazali in the infamies of the Bathanites um, comes out as a staunch defender of rationalism in, in religion and um, shows it to be indispensable. He, in fact, and this is curious at the very least, um, provides refutations of some of his own skeptical arguments as presented later in The Deliverer. I tried to um, set, set the two texts in juxtaposition in, in an article on Al-Ghazali's skepticism that came out something like um, 2010, I think. Anyhow, um, in the, the Fadai, um, uh, Al-Ghazali already shows that, that he has adopted the whole um, framework of, of the Aristotelian organon. He situates his own um, work in the Fadai itself, in the infamies itself, um, at the intersection of dialectical and rhetorical persuasion, and he also lords demonstration for what it does, where it is capable of doing so, and he puts in place the, the kind of qualifications, the kind of limitations that, that he's famous for from the incoherence and other works where he says that, um, of course, demonstration does not reach into many of the more subtle divine mysteries. And that in such occasions we need to, um, we, we need to take recourse in revelation, in the pro, um, proclamations of the infallible um, instructor, who, however, um, far from what the Ismailis would be proposing, has to be regarded as the prophet Muhammad, or, or in previous times, the other, other prophets. Um, so, the infamies puts forward um, A. Al-Ghazali's um, adoption already of Aristotelian logic, which is a theme that's then subsequently developed into further treatises um, in, uh, issuing from 1095, the yardstick of knowledge, Me'yar al-ilm, and the touchstone of speculation, the Mehak al-Nadar, um, about which I will um, say relatively little. Otherwise, only to, to notice that that um, I'll I'll take Tony Street's word in um, in his analysis of the Meyar al Elm and saying that this is not an especially um, innovative work in in um, so, sort of uh, as an appropriation of Avicenna and logic. Um, Jules Janssen's further um, observations in pointing out the Farabian influence in 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 
um, Ghazali's understanding of Aristotelian logic, and the fact that the Mihak and Nadar is, an ex is essentially an extended exercise in trying to show the practical utility of Aristotelian logic for both um, Islamic theology and the practice of Islamic law. Thick. Um, but coming, rolling back now to um, the infamies of, of the esotericists, um, Al-Ghazali comes out as a defender of rationalism methodologically. He expresses skepticism about the ability of reason to reach certain kinds of more subtle conclusions about um, the Godhead and about um, God's relation to reality. And, and this is the thing that I think has, has got the least attention um, in the literature so far, in a concluding section on the qualities of a just ruler, um, Al-Ghazali goes ahead and provides a list of attributes, of positive attributes for a, a just ruler, where, where of course um, Al-Mustadhir is, is, is meant in the immediate context, that gels rather well already with what is found later in the scale of action, and, and this is much more important and prominent in the revival of the religious sciences, etc., etc., Al-Ghazali um, insists that in, uh, in putting in place what's essentially a, a um, Platonist tripartite analysis of the soul, of um, a, a need to counteract the, the vices in order for um, divine illumination to, to occur, and so on and so forth. So it appears that um, already when writing the infamies, something like the program of the scale of action has emerged for him. All right, so much for that. Um, now, the incoherence of the philosophers, of course, is Al-Ghazali's other major polemical treatise stemming from this point. I'm needing to come closer to the recording, I think, now, to, so, so that I don't get cast in the shade entirely. Um, this is disconcerting. Okay, so the incoherence of the philosophers is a another major polemical treatise from this point. And here I follow the analysis of, of many others um, before me. Frank Griffel has done marvelous work in, in, in sort of um, establishing the actual scope and ambit of the incoherence of the philosophers, as, as I've done many others. I've done some work of, of my own on this topic as well. Al-Ghazali, in his introductions, again, um, uh, affirms the usefulness of, of logic as a, an all-purpose tool for reasoning and only iterates and underlines something that comes up in many of the later works as well, that this that logic is in fact a common inheritance of humankind not exclusive to the philosophers despite the latter's, latter's claims. Um, he, between the lines, let's understand that he in fact approves of much of the philosopher's uh, picture of the cosmos of its of, of its understanding of say the way that that the celestial spheres mediate um, in 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 sort of regulating uh, the the um, sensible world and the sublunary universe and and again this is this is to my mind much more remarkable in the final section of the incoherence of the philosophers if you go to the twentieth discussion um, and look at Al Ghazali's present presentation of the philosophers. Um, soteriology, the philosopher's understanding of human salvation and otherworldly bliss. Al-Ghazali ends up saying that, that he has no quarrel with much of what the philosophers have to say about such as things as the acquisition of virtues, the, the struggle against the vices, the need to, to polish the mirror of the soul. Um, also, much more precise points, such as the notion that Virtue is the lukewarm mean between the, the two extremes of, of hot and cold, um, which is something that, that I've, I've, I've given some thought to in an article that I, I published on Al-Ghazali on the emotions recently. Um, that is to say, Al-Ghazali has a, a particular take on how um, counteracting the various vices is um, and establishing the virtuous mean is, is in fact something where we strive for the closest thing to apathy that we can get to so that the proper love of God may be instilled in us. This is something that I do not find um, in the philosophical sources that I've, I've encountered so far, and so I'm puzzled as to whether Al-Ghazali was doing already constructive um, philosophical work at, at this stage, and if so, how long, in fact, this kind of, of reconceptualization 
of certain aspects of, of the philosopher's moral psychology had been in effect. But be that as it may, um, in the third, um, in this third section, I think that I, what I've, I've tried to establish is that um, Al Ghazali's engagement with the philosophers and his his so, so, sort of piecemeal appropriation of philosophical doctrine, um, with certain kinds of qualifications, certain kinds of safeguards put in place, um, actually cuts through his, um, his, his his authorship leading up to his do- departure from Baghdad. And in the final and fourth section of this talk, I would like to ask um, what, if anything, um, changes in in the lead up and the follow up to his um, departure. When taken as a whole, Al Ghazali's works from 1095, the way I see it, represent a series of attempts to approach the philosophical tradition from a variety of angles. The incoherence of the philosophers um, is, is more than anything else an attempt to neutralize certain objectionable aspects of philosophy while leaving room for the appropriation of the rest. The two treatises on logic, Meyar al-Elm and Mihak al-Nadar, um, are varying ways of, of, of um, showing al-Ghazali's mastery of philosophical logic and, logic and of proving its utility to religious professionals of various sorts. The scale of action is probably Al-Ghazali's most per- personal attempt at showing um, how, uh, what kind of promise philosophy holds for the felicity of the human being. But at the same time, the um, specific picture that it paints about the cognitive prospects of various types of humankind follows the philosophical model so closely that it doesn't um, lend any great promise to the great majority of, of um, the Muslim population. Finally, the moderation in belief in following um, Juwaini's example manages to introduce certain aspects of, of Avicen and learning into the, the Kalam picture, and as Richard Frank again intimates in Al Ghazali and the Asharite school, probably at least creates the conceptual space um, to introduce a whole lot more, even if it's not done uh, in an explicit manner. Um, but the problem with all of these taken jointly is that they don't seem to cohere into a single unitary project. And what's more, it appears that um, the, the kinds of genres in which Al-Ghazali works don't allow him to make the kind of headway that he wants to, wants to be making in um, adjusting the teachings of the philosophers to suit the worldview that he's crafting. And so, I would suggest that a first clue as to what may have been happening to Al-Ghazali in 1095, and what subsequently determined the radical turn that his authorship took, is the fact that that his following, again, the stru- structures and protocols of these different genres of writing was proving more a hindrance than a help at that point. Al-Ghazali may have been successful, outwardly speaking, in, in crafting these kinds of treatises and subsequently publishing them, we don't really, again, know um, when some of these were released to the public, and we don't know what their public reception would have been um, had Al-Ghazali not, you know, not uh, made his departure from, from Baghdad. But I think that it's not too much to, to speculate that, that Al-Ghazali may have felt as though he had reached a kind of an impasse or a cul-de-sac with, with this way, of operating. Um, a second clue, and this is this is where I'm, I'm probably going um, uh, against the, the grain. I'm, I'm operating in a somewhat counterintuitive way. The second clue as to what may have been happening comes, oddly enough, from the deliverer from error. Now, in a just published article, um, Al Ghazali and the on the origins of ethics, which came out in Newman, I've tried to argue in detail how the deliverer presents a particular picture of the philosopher's ethics in order to argue for the primacy of revelation um, in in establishing the way to salvation. And I I actually, um, at this point, um, simply simply reference that work for a a detailed version of the argument that follows. But what I want to highlight now is a a, a sort of a different aspect of of, of what I was doing there. Um, In 
describing the way of the Sufis in the Deliverer. Al-Ghazali um, says that he had become convinced of the necessity of adopting the Sufi path um, and and for for some sort sort of um, undisclosed um, purposes, but but the 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 phrases that he uses are, are are such that that the Sufis are the masters of the hearts and they're privy to to um, specific kinds of insight into into God and so on and so forth, all fairly standard, um, but but also phrases that um, assume a, a, spe an, a specific a specific significance to Al Ghazali himself in the post 1095 post revival period. Now, what follows is, to me, interesting. Al-Ghazali says that knowledge came easier to him than works. He realized that, that he should pursue um, both knowledge and, and works, and so he had, he'd read through the Sufi manuals, he tells us, but knowledge came easier to him than works, and that therefore um, he despaired eventually of his ability to actually shed his worldly attachments to to actually disassociate from his own own worldly pursuits and so on and so forth. Um, now, my initial suggestion here is that we actually take Al Ghazali for once at his word. That we actually take seriously what he's what he's saying here. Um, there's there, there's precious little reason for Al Ghazali to interject the kind of, of, of sort of description that he does about his own hemming and hawing, about his, his, his vacillations of his doubts, or, and so on. Um, furthermore, when it comes to describing Al-Ghazali's uh, eventual kind of turning back to God, his tawbah, ta repentance is not really the word, word here that we want to be using, it, it's more like, like turning towards God. Um, again, if Al-Ghazali had simply wanted to stage this or fabricate the account, one would think that it would have been much easier for, for him to have, have um, mounted a pilgrimage to Mecca and then, then, then um, theatrically orchestrate a, a sort of a one-time conversion. So, sort of, but Well, it could have happened also on a road to Damascus, I suppose. Um, a, a sort of a one-time deal where, where everything would suddenly have become clear. So when he records instead that, that he found it tremendously difficult to adopt the Sufi path, and that that this eventually led to a, a certain kind of a breakdown or a meltdown. Um, I suggest that we should take this seriously. For one thing, because it seems to me as though um, actually uh, fabricating the whole thing would be more difficult um, than than accepting it, the, this account's essential veracity. But what would this kind of breakdown then be about? Well, here my suggestion is that we go back now to the very um, passages in the scale of action that that Ken Garden had referenced previously. Um, Ken Garden points out that that Al Ghazali had said in the scale of action that that the sort of the ideal pursuant of of, of divine wisdom would be one who would first adopt the the path of knowledge or that of speculation, um, come to a recognition of the limits of that speculation, but but be able to establish demonstratively everything, the burhaniya way, everything that there is to demonstrate, and that there, thereafter then greater clarity into um, the, the sort of the structure of reality could be had by the one who denounces the world, who um, regulates their passions, etc., etc. Now, if again we assume that Al-Ghazali is being, um, in, in a sense, sense, describing what he genuinely legitimately um believes is the program for a kind of a spiritual rectification and and improvement and subsequent illumination then we would uh, assume that he attempted to pursue this path himself so let's assume here for the moment that that around the time that al ghazali was was, was putting the finishing touches to the scale of action which Again, largely as a derivative work, um, where where whole passages seem to be more or less transcriptions or or paraphrases of Rahib or or of um, Avicenna. That when putting the finishing touches to the scale, um, Al Ghazali himself was attempting, within the privacy of of his own own dwelling, um, presumably without a Sufi master, because we never hear of one, to to um, engage in some kinds of, of either Sufi practices or um, philosophically understood kind of um, spiritual improvement practices, or, or both. And, and let us furthermore here take into 
uh, account the fact that the that the scale of action it um, is pretty thin when it comes to specifically Islamic components. Um, by contrast with the revival of the religious sciences, which, which, which of course is, is replete with materials that, that span the entire Islamic spiritual tradition. So, with that in mind, um, if, if we here assume that what Al-Ghazali was expecting to happen in 1095 is a greater illumination into divine matters, then we're faced with the following question. Um, and th this, this is something where I'll have to simply appeal to the, the intuitions of, of, of the different participants of this conference, and maybe this is a fruitful place for opening up discussion. What is religious experience supposed to be anyway? And this is, again, sort of forms part of um, my the education that I had in religious studies for a, a, a couple of years. It's a fabulously and famously problematic category. Um, the question about what is supposed to happen in, in sort, sort of specifically religious experiences, how they differ from other mundane ones, uh, how they're supposed to be differing, how to describe those differences, um, whether, in fact, um, the, the only way that we can um, talk about them taking shape is in a societal context where, again, different kinds of structures of legitimation take place, and so on and so forth. So, Let's, let, let's assume that, that Al-Ghazali is hoping for some kind of divine illumination to arrive, um, which would hopefully, in his mind, also, um, also resolve some of the specific kinds of, of, of uh, misgivings that he has about how the philosophical worldview fits in with certain kinds of, of commitments that he has from, his, from, from a theological or from a, a spiritual standpoint, the many ways in which the Avicennan system, for all of its sort of um, religious dressing, sometimes forms an awkward fit with, with some of the more specific um, Islamic materials that Al-Ghazali is working with. So let's assume that uh, Al-Ghazali is, is waiting for such illumination and assume that it maybe fails to arrive, because, hey, religious experience. Um, with that, I think that we can take fairly seriously and, and, and fairly in earnest what Al-Ghazali um, describes as his own aphasia of, 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 of a kind of a paralysis hitting him both on a personal and a professional level. He's no longer able to work the way that he once did. Um, that he sees little point in doing so. On the other hand, he sees no immediate way forward. Now, what happens next, then, following this story, um, is up to you in a sense. It's up to me, it's up to you. Um, there are two alternative stories here, depending on, on, on how we, again, um, uh, on what, what kind of mindset we're crafting stories about people experiencing religious conversions and, 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 and so, sort of sudden turn, religious turns. On one story, Al-Ghazali all of a sudden achieves a kind of an illumination, um, finds exactly that, that God has made what was previously difficult now easy for him, and so on. Um, proceeds to depart from Baghdad and immerse himself now in in the Islamic literature and realizes that working his way through the the sort of the the bulk of Islamic spiritual literature affords him added insight into how to put certain kinds of philosophical concepts into an Islamic context um, provides him with the freedom to then then to to, to so, sort of um, reconceive of certain things in line with with what he thinks the truth of the matter must be etc etc um by the lights of another more, more, more sort of sceptical and, if not cynical, but, um, line of reasoning, whether or not Al-Ghazali experienced any such thing, he would, um, he, he would um, depart Baghdad anyway and hope that perhaps such illumination will arrive if, and, and arise if he just um, sticks now with, with this program of realizing that perhaps he needs to immerse himself in, in more Islamic learning in order to, to facilitate a more properly Islamic understanding of what's going on. Now, Choosing between those two stories uh, is, is entirely up to you, it's up to me, we can talk about, about, about that. But what I would submit at this point, and this is by way of a conclusion, I've gone for too long already, um, is that if we take seriously the, the notion that, that um, Al-Ghazali believed that in order to uh, achieve a proper enlightenment, a proper purification of the soul and, and subsequent enlightenment, one needs to immerse oneself in 
the, the sort of sort of the beating heart of the Islamic spiritual tradition, and that this kind of 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 of, of immersion will um, result in a a purer understanding both of what the philosophical tradition was in fact trying to get at, um, even when the philosophers um, went astray in in some of the, the particulars of their reasoning, and that um, then again in a mirror image of this an immersion in a proper theoretical understanding of reality would allow one to read then the um, Islamic spiritual materials in a, a, a fresh and correct light, then we have a kind of a blueprint for understanding what happens in Al-Ghazali's subsequent authorship. It provides Al-Ghazali himself, and I think that this is probably a psychological truth as well, with a, 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 a sort of a, a suitable framework in which he can approach the primarily Avicennan, but to some extent uh, um, otherwise philosophical materials, with a, a so, sort of a, a fresh eye, taking what he wants, but also seeing um, uh, and, and acknowledging where he thinks there are, are pressure points or where there are uh, so, sort of turns not taken or, or wrong turns taken. So that, for instance, he can modify the philosophical semantics so as to, to, to acknowledge the ways in which God's Mahia is is unattainable. This is from um, the the treatise on the beautiful names in my um, two articles from 2010 and 2011, or the ways in which the the ways in which the philosophical theory of the emotions has to be um, modified in order to um, work out a philosophical approach to why the religious sciences have gone astray, as in um, the, the the sort of the the pieces on emotion and error that I've been looking at, and so on and so forth. Um, in other words, I would. I would put forward that that um, the the narrative that I've crafted about what may or may have happened to Al Ghazali in 1095 um, legitimates some of what I've been doing in my works on Al Ghazali in recent times. Now, whether you'll 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 accept these kinds of legitimate legitimation procedures, um, I leave up to you and up to the subsequent discussion. Thank you very much.